Thank you all for coming. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Guyot today. Nick obtained his PhD at Princeton and joined the history faculty at Cambridge University in 2014. He's written about American history and politics for the London Review of Books, The Nation, Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian, and New York Review of Books. His book publications include Providence and the Invention of the United States, States, which examines the emergence of American religious nationalism from the founding of Virginia in 1607 to the collapse of Reconstruction, and Bind Us Apart, How Enlightened Americans, I didn't know there were enlightened, enlightened Americans, <laughs> invented racial segregation, which explores the unsettling relationship between ideas of racial equality and programs for racial separation in the early American Republic. His talk today is based on a book he's currently working on, which is forthcoming with basic books. So thank you. Please join me in thanking um, Nick for joining us today. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, Kareen says, I speak too fast. I think Kareen speaks too fast. So if you feel like I'm going too quickly, please just wave and I will try and slow down. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, George Tankata for inviting me. I want to thank all of the people who have made my stay uh, just for a few days, but such a lovely one, uh, including Hager, who's been wonderful in terms of making the arrangements, and all of the admin and support staff as well. Uh, my driver this morning was awesome, so I'm very grateful to him. Um, it's really lovely to be here. Uh, I've given a version of this talk in Britain and in the United States, and it struck me that there are some aspects of the kind of background story here, which I might want to lean on a bit more for you guys if you don't necessarily have all the kind of details of your early 19th century American and European history kind of completely down. So I'm going to try and do that uh, a bit. Um, I should also say that this is about a book I'm working on. I'm sort of supposed to finish it by the end of the year. Technically, I haven't started it, so there are some issues. There are some issues there, um, but I'm starting to think that this might be quite easy to write when I can figure it out. So again, I'd be really interested if there are some things you can help me with. Uh, you have some questions that touch on things I haven't figured out. I've not figured the whole thing out. Um, okay, let me get started. Uh, in the final weeks of 1814, uh, the 20th largest American city, measured by population, was actually in a cold and gloomy corner of southwest England, 6,000 Americans, mostly sailors, were incarcerated in Dartmoor Prison, desperately hoping that the War of 1812 would soon be over. And again, history fact, uh, the War of 1812 is the last time that Britain and the United States went to war with each other. Uh, they have never fought since. I guess I shouldn't say in our current crazy moment that they never will fight again. Uh, but in effect, the first 50 years of American history are all about fighting Britain. And in 1814, the end of that year, with these 6,000 prisoners in this prison in Britain, they must think that this hatred, this enmity between Britain and the United States is going to just carry on rolling. So they don't know that there isn't going to be another war between Britain and the United States. Now, nearly all of these 6,000 prisoners are still in this prison in the spring of 1815, even though the treaty which ends the War of 1812 has been ratified by the US Senate in February. So March, April of 1815, these 6,000 sailors are still in the prison. Uh, it had been a particularly hard winter in the prison, um, but the British authorities refused to release the Americans until arrangements could be made to transport them back to the United States. So they weren't just going to open up the gates and say, hey, American sailors, come out into Britain. Instead, they had to wait in the prison as prisoners until these arrangements to try and repatriate them could be uh, arranged. And well, you guys will know this story. I mean, private contractors, you know, trying to pay people to come and do the job of picking these guys up in big ships and taking them back. There are lots and lots of uh, murky things going on which delay this process. So in April of 1815, these sailors are almost all still there. Now, on the 6th of April, 1815, a minor disagreement between the prison guards and the prisoners spirals out of control. Uh, essentially a ball from the American sailors, the American prisoners, sails over one of the inner walls of the prison. So they're all playing baseball in one of these bits. A, wall sail, a ball sails over the wall, uh, and uh, the guards won't give the ball back. 
the American sailors who are feeling pretty desperate and looking for any excuse to go nuts, uh, they start scratching away at one of these internal walls. And they're not made of stone, some of these. They're made of a kind of mud. So actually, they're able to get through the wall. And the next thing, the guards are saying, oh, the Americans are trying to escape. And they're not trying to escape. They just want their ball back. But the plan is, you know, for the British, oh, we have to try and make sure that they understand they need to stay in this prison. They're the prisoners. So there's a shot fired in the air, and there's a shot fired down on the ground, and then there are more shots fired. And before you know what's happened, there has been a massacre. Dozens of American prisoners have been wounded. Nine are dead. Seven died right there, and another two died of their wounds thereafter. One sailor from Massachusetts went back from this kind of killing field in the middle of the prison. And you can see here in the image that this is actually the kind of moment of the massacre taking place. Uh, here are the British soldiers, and there you can see them firing on the American prisoners. One sailor from Massachusetts went back to his cell and actually scribbled out in his journal, which we still have, it is worse than the massacre at Boston in 1770. And he's referring there again, if you know a little American history, to this famous, famous shooting that took place in the city of Boston just before the American Revolution, uh, in which uh, five American protesters, including an African American, which is going to be important to our story, are killed by the British outside the Customs House, which is where this protest has been going on. So the Boston Massacre became one of these kind of crucial stories that led to the American Revolution. So in 1815, this one Massachusetts sailor goes back to his journal and says, this is worse than the Boston Massacre. And also, this is going to be remembered, right? That we're not going to forget what's gone on. Well, there were some obvious and immediate effects uh, to what happened that day. These killings hastened the British and American government's efforts to get these 6,000 men out of the prison. So after all of this kind of you know, waiting around, finally there's an expediting uh, of the evacuation of Dartmoor Prison. Um, the entire American contingent are marched down to Plymouth, which is the town on the coast, uh, and they're sent back in transports to the United States by the end of July. So the process is sped up, but still it's going to take a few more months to finish it. The prisoners who survived assumed that what they were calling the Dartmoor Massacre uh, would become as famous as the Boston Massacre of 1770, that the treachery, the cruelty of the British... Uh, in 1815 would never be forgotten, never forget British cruelty. Uh, but although more Americans were killed at Dartmoor in 1815 than had been killed in Boston in 1770, the Dartmoor massacre didn't get the same traction, didn't get the same purchase as what happened in Boston in 1770. And in fact, the Dartmoor massacre fell away from American history altogether. Um, it kind of disappeared so much that even people that might have read about this, like in graduate school, they were read a chapter in a book, you talk to them 20 years later, they can't remember it. Like it doesn't have any kind of standing in the way Americans think about their history, which I think is really interesting. And again, it kind of makes you think about why we remember some things and not others. It's a very simple point, but this I think is a, an event that really forces you to think about what gets remembered. Uh, as the historian Eric Hinderaker has recently argued uh, in this very cool book, uh, which I recommend called Boston's Massacre. Let me see if I can find it. Here we are. Yeah, Boston's Massacre. Um, the memory of that massacre back in 1770 has its own complicated history. Rather than people deciding in 1770, God, we need to remember this forever, actually, at different moments in American history, the massacre kind of came back into focus. So different people kind of tried to bring what happened in Boston back into the kind of public memory. And as always with history, they were usually doing this for particular political ends. So, um, you know, there were reasons that people wanted to get hold of this jagged piece of the past and kind of do things with it. But the protests in 1770 slotted very easily into a story about American history, which you could just tell very straightforwardly. The story is simple. Uh, American history in the late 18th century is about trying to get the hell away from Britain, right? Uh, it's about trying to escape from Britain. Here's a massacre which demonstrates that we need to be independent. It's much trickier to create a narrative that helps you make sense of what happened in 1815, 
as I said, the War of 1812 was the last war fought between Britain and the United States. Those nine prisoners of war who were killed in Dartmoor were the last Americans to be killed by uh, British soldiers, at least the last ones outside of you know, collateral damage or um, you know, those kinds of things that happen in wars you don't intend. Um, but of course, no one knew in 1815 that Britain and the United States would never fight another war. And in fact, the American government in 1815 was really keen not to reopen the war. So remember I said the war was over? They didn't want this to be an event that would actually cause the war to start again. So those killings in 1815 didn't lend themselves to the same kind of propaganda war that you could wage with the Boston Massacre back in 1770. Um, now, for a bunch of reasons, which I'm going to try and share with you today, I think that this Dartmoor massacre is actually worth remembering. Uh, and let me give you one very obvious one, which, again, I just think is incredible and a reason we ought to be thinking much more as historians about what went on there. I mentioned there were 6,000 or so prisoners there at the end of 1814. There was a total of 6,500 prisoners who came into the prison from the United States between 1813 and 1815. Well, nearly a 1,000 of them were black. So you had around 15% of the prison population was black. Now, these were mostly sailors of color who had either been traveling on or working on American ships that got caught by the British, or in some cases, they were sailors of color who had actually been serving in the British Royal Navy. Usually not voluntarily. I mean, like, nobody serves voluntarily in the Royal Navy <laughs> in the early 19th century. You know, you, get, you go out and get drunk in a pub, and then someone hits you over the head, and then you get dragged off to a ship, right? It's called being press-ganged or being impressed. It's a funny word. So actually, that process is what brings many sailors into the Royal Navy, but also many black sailors. So you have these 1,000 black sailors who are coded as American, and find themselves in the prison. Now, here's the weird part. On the ships that they worked on, black and white sailors mostly served side by side. Ships are kind of brutal places. They're very top down. There's the officers, the captain, and so on. They give orders that are carried out. But amongst the ordinary sailors, white and black distinctions are not prominent. You can make more money as an ordinary black sailor than as a white sailor if you have special talents or experience. So it's a kind of rare place in the early 19th century where we shouldn't call it workplace equality, but there is some kind of um, buffer against some of the effects of race on shore, on the mainland, where you know there's all kinds of discrimination. But what makes that system work is you have these elite officers giving out orders. So you know, you've got your officers who are kind of brutalizing everyone, <laughs> and a black and white are kind of equally victim of their ordinary sailors. Um, but what happens when you get to the prison is that the officers on board the ships are all taken out. They actually aren't in the prison. The captains, you know, the kind of first officers, all those guys are taken to a little village where they get to live in a nice little house. So they're still in prison, but they're like living in, you know, it's like an open prison. They don't go into here. So in fact, what happens is you kind of decapitate the leadership on the ships and then leave these ordinary sailors in the prison without their officers. And that's crucial to our story. So it's that kind of divorcing of the control, the hierarchy, the coercion of the maritime world. Once that goes, you have black and white ordinary sailors left alone with each other. Uh, okay, um, so one of the things we can do with this Dartmoor story is see what happens when these racially mixed worlds at sea run aground. Like what happens when you kind of put those into a place you know, where you don't have that same discipline? What kind of community will they create without their officers? Uh, and one of the questions I'm trying to answer in the book, and I'm not sure I've completely figured this out, but it's whether or not we can think about this prison with black and white sailors in it as a kind of community which looks anything like the cities and the towns back in the United States. So again, just to give you some context, this is the decade, the 1810s, in which in big American cities, places like New York, and Philadelphia and Baltimore, you have around somewhere between 8 and 12% of those cities, the population is black. 
So they're free blacks, they're not slaves in most of those northern cities. So actually they are living alongside white people and social reformers, anti-slavery campaigners are all arguing, can black and white people live together in freedom? You know, can we make this work in these cities in the north? Well, my story is about whether black and white people can live together in captivity. So it kind of tips that on its head. Is it related? Can we say that this community looks something like those communities? Well, one very, very big difference is that there are no women in Dartmoor. And again, I know this sounds like, <laughs> you know the way that guys write books and don't put women in? It's like now I've found a book subject that makes it really hard to get women in. But sometimes the absence of women is something you can talk about. And I think in this story, the absence of women in the prison is really, really crucial. So again, we can maybe come back to think about why uh, later on. Uh, okay, right, there are loads of huge stories, um, fascinating things from Dartmoor that I want to share, um, but I'm just going to try and do three things quickly today. Um, one of them is I want to say something about how this story of Dartmoor might link to our thinking about how prisons work. Uh, so again, to use the kind of fancy, fashionable term, um, we now talk, when we talk about prisons and incarceration, about something called carceral culture. Uh, so, you know, the kind of carceral state, there's a huge literature on that now. How do we get to the modern prison? Uh, and how many of the roots of the modern prison are in this moment? So that's one thing I want to flag, like, is there any connection between this prison of war camp and prisons more generally? I also want to talk briefly about segregation. Uh, Dartmoor ends up being the first racially segregated prison in American history, despite the fact it's in Britain. Uh, but the story about how black and white inmates come to be separated from each other is much more complicated and interesting, I think, than that sounds. And finally, I just want to say something briefly about how the story of Dartmoor intersects with stories of citizenship. Who were these white and black Americans? Did they see themselves as kind of proud, triumphant, loyal uh, citizens of the United States? Uh, or particularly for the communities of color, these black sailors, did they actually see themselves in a different context? Did they have options? Did they have to be American or nothing? Or could they have other forms of allegiance? Uh, okay, well, I'm just very briefly going to take you um, through an idea of what the sources look like. And I'll do this super fast, but again, I think, I hope this is interesting. Um, we have three different kinds of sources about what happened. One of them, which is really cool, is we have a bunch of published accounts of uh, the massacre or the prison experience. So loads of sailors essentially went off and wrote up what happened to them. Most of these were published. There are a few of them which you can find in historical societies and archives, and uh, so you can find them in manuscript. But there's a whole bunch of these. So you can see a few of them here. Uh, the first wave of these come out just after the massacre, but then actually there's another wave in the 1830s and 1840s including one version of this, which was edited and embellished by the novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne, you know, who's a big figure in American history and culture, obviously, uh, but who uh, did his own version of what happened at Dartmoor, which I just think is fascinating. And this is his here, uh, The Reminiscences of a Dartmoor Prisoner, which he writes up in the middle of the 1840s. Okay, so there's that set of sources. Uh, this manuscript one here, I found this just the other week. I absolutely love this. Uh, so here, talking about... Uh, arriving at the dreary, bleak, and barren moor. So this is written by a sailor in their journal, and I dug this up, uh, just last week in an archive in Massachusetts. Uh, not a shrub or a tree can be seen within three miles of its circumference. The farmers term it the devil's land, inhabited by ghosts and sundry imaginary beings. They do not dare pass by it at night, and then crucially, rabbits cannot live there. So this is such a scary area that you can't have any rabbits. Um, okay, so that's one set of sources. Another set is newspaper accounts. There were loads of write-ups of this in the papers. Um, and the third set of sources is the uh, archives, the papers, the kind of machinery of the bureaucracy. So the Admiralty Board, which was the part of the Royal Navy that ran the prison, tons of letters from there to the bloke who actually was in charge of the prison, who was called the agent, basically the prison governor. All of that stuff you can find in London, uh, in the National Archives. Um, and I think the most fascinating of these sources is the prison register, 
Uh, this is what it looked like at Dartmoor. You've got these prisoner of war registers everywhere, but there are these five giant books, and each one of them contains about 1,000 or 1,200 names. So if you look up close, let me get a bit closer. Okay, uh, do you see here this category, black, mulatto, black, black. It's fascinating. When you got to the prison, there'd be these two guys at a desk at the front, the clerks, who would actually check you in. And one of the things they did at Dartmoor, which they didn't do at other prisons, is they would try and come up with some version of your complexion or your appearance. So in a way, these two guys, British guys, sitting there at the desk are kind of making race, right? If you're from Colombia and your skin is quite dark, black. Let's say you're from India and you just happen to have gotten caught up in this, so South Asia, right? You come in, black. Let's say you're from Canton and you're Chinese, Mulatto. So all of these people are kind of brought into the prison from a bunch of different places, and they find these two white guys at a desk, a bit like this one, sitting there making race. And the great thing, the amazing thing about the register is it's all there. So all six and a half thousand of these prisoners have that column filled in. Now, if you're a white guy like me, it probably says something like, your complexion is fresh, <laughs> you know, or your complexion is light doesn't actually say white, right? But it does say black, mulatto, uh, a colored man, Negro. So there are these different terms. So uh, what I've done, because I'm, a, as you can see, a gigantic nerd, uh, is that I have created my own electronic version of the prison database, which is not something I recommend anyone do. Uh, but if you've got this, you can do all kinds of really cool things with it, right? So one thing you can do with it is you can figure out where these black prisoners came from, because in addition to the race, you can also find out here where they came from, so where they say they were born, how old they were, what their role was on the ship, uh, their appearance, uh, five foot four inches, stout mulatto, two scars on right hand. Uh, whether or not they were in the Royal Navy or if they came in on a commercial ship, but then also here, huge amounts of very interesting material. Uh, um, so a huge amount of material here, which gives you a really strong sense of the paper trail that might have been left behind by these people. Because generally speaking, people of color are leaving far fewer sources. They're not writing up versions of what happens in the prison. So all those prisoners' accounts, there isn't a single one I found by a prisoner of color. So as a historian, what can you do to try and balance out the fact that all the accounts are by white people? You can do this and you can go looking for letters from these people in other archives, or you can go looking for details in the census about what happens to them. So in a way, having this big uh, database has been a huge amount of fun for me. It's been tough to get it together, but now I have it. I think it will enable me to tell stories of people who otherwise can be quite hard for you to write about confidently and authoritatively. So kind of putting together the white and the black stories within the prison I think, I hope, this is going to help me to answer that challenge. Uh, okay, so I said I'd talk very quickly about these three things, and I will um, blow through this um, as quickly as I can. Uh, the first thing I mentioned was prison culture. If you guys know anything about um, Michel Foucault, the French theorist of prisons, or Jeremy Bentham, uh, the great English prison reformer of the early 19th century, if you look at this picture of a circular prison, you might kind of have in the back of your mind a bit of recollection and think, ah, that looks a bit like the panopticon, which was that great idea of Jeremy Bentham that every single cell would be viewed and monitored from uh, prison guards in the center. There's to be like a tower in the middle, and then there'd be a circular prison, and you could kind of see into all the prisoners' cells. So, you know, kind of thinking about incarceration as surveillance, round prison must be the same. It's not the same. <laughs> um, this is actually very different from that model. Um, what you've got here is these prison blocks at the top. Um, eventually, as you've seen from one of the other slides, they end up building walls between them. But when the guys come into the prison, they can effectively choose which, which one of these prison blocks they live in. The prison uh, blocks themselves don't have any doors inside. There are no rooms. There are no individual cells. Uh, you have a hammock, <laughs> and you have to sling your hammock somewhere in this giant kind of warehouse. So actually, what you don't have here is that same kind of individualized, that same kind of compartmentalized prison setup 
that you would have or you're going to have in prisons in Britain and the United States. But here's what's interesting, I think, about this moment. Actually, those kind of famous prisons that begin to isolate human beings in single cells and begin to become kind of committed to the idea of people reforming themselves through isolation and through work, that's actually a little later, not much later, but a little later in American history. So um, let me see if I can show you a picture of one of them. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is the state penitentiary, the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. Uh, this is one of the first prisons to have individual cells. The other one is, is the state prison in New York, in Auburn, New York. Um, those two prisons emerge only in the 1820s. Auburn's built in 1819, but it doesn't get individual cells until later in the 1820s. Eastern State Penitentiary is built in 1829. So these visions of where prisons are going and, you know, these look a lot like some contemporary, like modern prisons. The same ideas, individualization, keeping people locked away on their own for hours and hours every day. That's a little later. In fact, in 1814 and 1815, prisons in the United States look a lot more like Dartmoor prison. By which I mean, if you get thrown into prison, you don't have a cell. You have like a general dormitory that you sleep in. Depending on how friendly you are with the governor, you might be allowed to buy stuff, so you might actually be allowed to buy and sell things uh, and bring things into the prison, and then the governor would pocket the money that he made from that, right? And he'd use that to pay his salary or his uh, guard salaries. Um, if you were a debtor, your whole family would move into the prison, so you literally have entire families living inside the prison. This stuff does not happen when you begin to get this kind of prison. But this earlier moment, so the 1810s, 1814, 1815, actually the Dartmoor model is much closer to the way American prisons look. So one of the crucial questions I have to figure out is whether actually what we're seeing here in just a few years after Dartmoor is a kind of divergence where prisoners of war, prisoner of war camps, and regular prisons are going to start looking very different. So in effect, you know, you move to 1850, a prisoner of war camp still looks a bit like Dartmoor, and a regular prison looks like this, and they're very different. Is that the way this is going? So there's about to be a divergence. Or are there still some ways in which what takes place in this prison in Dartmoor might have something to tell us about the development of carceral culture, the way that we think about prisons as spaces for managing race or deviance or all kinds of other things. So that's one question I don't think I've completely figured out yet. Um, okay, so that's the kind of prison culture question, which I think is very important and very interesting. But let me move on to the issue of segregation, because this is kind of what I work on, I have worked on in the past, and I'm very interested in this. Um, so in October of 1813, this is five months after the first American sailors have arrived at Dartmoor, a group of white American sailors petitioned the Dartmoor governor, the agent of the prison, the guy in charge, to be moved away from their black compatriots. Uh, now, no reason was given for this at the time, or at least none that was recorded, although one of the prisoners who left a memoir immediately after uh, the, the massacre, uh, a guy called Charles Andrews from Rhode Island, he insisted that the reason for the segregation was that black prisoners had been stealing from white prisoners. So he said it was so tough for us in the prison, the black sailors were stealing our staff, so please can we be moved somewhere else? Uh, that was what he said. Now, historians have tended either to believe that directly, so to believe that black sailors were stealing from white sailors, or to say that this just proves that the white prisoners uh, were kind of white supremacists, right? That in effect they needed to be and wanted to be away from black people because of their racism. And I think the real story is a tiny bit more complicated. Um, first, uh, because, maybe this is the primary reason, actually, it wasn't just Americans in this prison block in the fall of 1813. Also in this prison block with them were French prisoners. And the French prisoners had been in Dartmoor prison since it had been opened in 1808. So these were prisoners of war from Britain's other war with Napoleon, which had been going on for like 20 years, right? So those prisoners who were in uh, this prison block, they weren't just French. I mean, French would be bad. Oh, it was much worse. 
they were actually a group of French prisoners who had uh, lost their minds. And by lost their minds, I mean that they had decided, because of their despair at being stuck in a prison for years and years on end, that they would adopt a new moral code. No clothes, uh, no food, so when they got their ration, they would sell it, and they would eat a kind of broth, and uh, actions which were deemed unspeakable, uh, which may have related to sexual practices, uh, and the Americans in the prison were like, whoa, uh, these French, they've lost their minds. Uh, one incident that was particularly appalling, which I probably can speak about, is uh, when two horses came into the prison yard one day, the French prisoners all ran at the horses and tried to eat them alive. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, so these French prisoners, who were called the Romans, and we call the Romans because they were in the very top of the building, which is called the capital of, of the building. So they were up there. They were known as Romans. Uh, these white American prisoners may, and I want to say I've not found conclusive proof of this, but a lot of strong supporting evidence, they may have been what the white American sailors were trying to get away from, which is fascinating, right? So it's like the white American sailors, hey, if we tell the prison governor we want to move away from the French, he'll never let us. Why don't we say we want to move away from the black people? That will work. And it does work. And actually what happens is the African-Americans and the other black sailors are left with the French, which is horrifying. And sure enough, the French do actually get moved out completely uh, just a little bit after this moment. Uh, they get moved down to prison hulks, so they get put on these giant ships, which this prison at Dartmoor was built to be more humane than these prison hulks that previously had contained prisoners. But actually, the Brits decide these French are so terrible, just put them back in the hulks. <laughs> That's really the best for everyone. So there's this crucial, crucial story uh, of the French. But there's one other thing I want to say about the segregation angle, which again, I think is so interesting. Here's what happens in the prison. Uh, you remember I said that they, uh, the sailors have lost their kind of officer class. So the people that gave them orders on the ships are gone. Well, here's what happens in the prison. They govern themselves. And they govern themselves by forming associations and communities and electing leaders. And effectively, they regulate their prison block. Now, again, let me let that sit with you for a second. So this is not like a prison guard or a prison governor coming in and telling the prisoners what to do. The prisoners are invited to govern and police themselves. So in addition to these white American sailors wanting to get away from the French, I think the other thing they want to get away from is sharing political power with black people. And again, I want to just kind of put into your minds here that when we think about how racism operates or when we think about the uh, challenges of coexisting across the color line, living alongside black people is one thing. Sharing food with black people, that's one thing. Even sleeping in the same place as black people. I mean, all of these things white sailors have done on the ships. What they haven't been asked to do on the ships is share power with black people, to create a politics amongst themselves in which there is a genuine racial equality. And I think it's that challenge, which, that, which they've never experienced before. They don't experience that back in the towns or the cities in the US. That's not the way things work. Black people aren't voting. But here, 15% black, it's a big number, lots and lots of potential political power. I believe it's that challenge which these white American sailors end up not being able to go through with. So again, it, it, of course it's racism. Of course it's white supremacy. But it's a particular kind of racism and white supremacy, which in a way points towards the bigger challenge for the United States, which it's still trying to work out, which is how do we run a politics that's genuinely equal and inclusive? So I, it seems invidious to say that we ought to kind of have like a sort of hierarchy or a spectrum of racisms, but we kind of need one. We kind of need to think about how racism operates in these different registers. And I think the sharing of political power is the real challenge for these guys. Uh, okay, all right. Um, let me move on to the final thing that I wanted to mention, uh, which is this question of how all of this relates to citizenship. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, there's one set of arguments, one set of um, kind of historiograph uh, historiographical uh, debates which surrounds this question of whether sailors were a particularly important group for understanding the development of citizenship in the US. Let me back up. Um, 
There isn't actually any federal citizenship in the US until 1868, by which I mean the federal government doesn't make you a citizen because you're born in the US until the 14th Amendment passes in 1868. You get your citizenship of the United States before then because of your citizenship of a particular state. But hey, different states treat citizenship in very different ways. So actually, a really interesting question in the early United States is, are black people citizens of the US? Well, yes and no. Partly it depends the context in which you're invoking this. It also depends where they're from. You may be a citizen or deemed a citizen in Massachusetts, and it may be impossible for you to become a black citizen in South Carolina. Now again, the federal government, the kind of national government of the United States, really ought to be the arbiter here, but it can't arbitrate because of course it's divided by the slavery question. So it doesn't arbitrate, it abdicates. So that's the kind of citizenship context. On these ships, though, you remember I started by talking about the press gang, about the ways in which the British effectively were taking black and white sailors from American ships and saying, right, now you're serving in the Royal Navy. This gave the federal government, the national government, a motive for trying to find a way to guarantee or proclaim citizenship for sailors. So actually, because sailors were out there in the Atlantic where their citizenship could be attacked by the British, British attack white people, black people, they take anyone, right? So in fact, the citizenship regime, which is introduced by the federal government, is applied to sailors. An act is passed in the 1790s that gives sailors the right to obtain a certificate, a piece of paper saying, this person is a citizen of the United States. And I was just down in Maryland in the National Archives, and it's incredible. So, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a certificate saying, you know, this certifies that John Smith, a colored man, is a citizen of the United States. It's crazy. It's incredible. So, in effect, this kind of maritime space, because the British are such a threat to American citizenship, black or white, becomes a place the federal government feels it has to kind of defend American citizens, regardless of their race. So there's been some really good stuff written about this. Um, this book by a guy called Nathan Pearl Rosenthal is really terrific. He says, in effect, that sailors become kind of brokers of national belonging. They become the people that force the American government to think, hey, we need to sort the citizenship thing out. We need to try and guarantee it. We can't just let our battles over slavery inside the US force us to abdicate from this. We, we need to guarantee citizenship. Uh, and also, one thing he does in this book is he talks about American citizens effectively proving that you can choose your nation. This is an interesting subject to talk about in this part of the world, maybe. But this idea that your nationality is something that you might be able to choose. So let's say an American sailor had been born in Britain, but they wanted to be an American. The American ideology says, sure, naturalize, become an American citizen. The British are like, no, you were born in Britain. You are forever a subject of the king. So the other thing he does in this book, which is really interesting, is he kind of mashes up these two different ideas about what it means to be a citizen. OK, so there's that literature saying, hey, sailors are really important because they are in the middle of these debates about how to create and protect US citizenship. And hey, what's really interesting is black sailors, as well as white sailors, can get these government certificates saying they are American. But then there's another literature, another historiography, which has a different view, uh, represented by Ira Berlin, sadly passed away earlier this year, and Jane Landers. Uh, and these guys argue that actually, if you're a sailor of color in the Atlantic world in the late 18th and early 19th century, Although you have many disadvantages, one of the ways in which you live your life is to blend and merge and kind of like move between worlds and nations. So maybe you go to Cuba and you become Cuban. Maybe you're five years as Cuban and then you decide you're gonna go off and become Haitian. You know, maybe you're done with being Haitian and you're gonna go and serve uh, in the American merchant marine. This idea of a kind of mobility and this idea that people of color in these sea spaces move between different nations. So in a way, they find a power from not being a permanent citizen, 
but being able to play different nations off each other and to take different kinds of allegiance when they need it and where they find it. So Landers and Berlin call these people Atlantic Creoles. So in effect, their vision of these 1,000 or so black sailors in Dartmoor would look very different from this other vision of Nathan Pearl Rosenthal, you know, that would see being a sailor as kind of the cradle of your American identity. Landers and Berlin would be like, no, actually, it's constraining to think that these 1,000 sailors of color were all African Americans waiting to be US citizens. Actually, I mean, I know this from looking at the records, at least 100, maybe 150 are not from the United States. They're from all kinds of other places, but they are put in the black prison in Dartmoor and they're treated like Americans. Are they actually going back to the United States? That's a massive challenge for me to try and figure that out. How do you trace all these thousand black sailors who are released? And if you can find them, does that help you to resolve this question of whether in effect they're all, they wanna be Americans, they want American citizenship. This is gonna be a kind of crucial moment for them to establish their Americanness. Or do they blend into other places, go to other nations, claim other allegiances once they get out of this horrible prison? Um, and I think that's such a key question and also one that resonates with us today in terms of the way that we structure our politics around claims to national belonging, but also thinking about people moving between different national belongings, different national allegiances in different worlds. So it's kind of tempting to say that we should think about Dartmoor as the place where African-Americans stake their claim to US citizenship. Is that completely accurate? Is, does that hold for all African-Americans? Uh, maybe not. Okay, um, let me sum up or try and conclude just by sort of taking that question, uh, thinking about African-Americans and what this whole thing means for them, taking it ahead of times. Um, I've been talking a bit about the Boston massacre uh, and also about the Dartmoor massacre. Um, one of the people that kind of invents the Boston massacre as a historical event in the 19th century is an African-American uh, abolitionist, a uh, writer and activist called William Coupernell. Uh, he lived in Boston uh, in the sort of second quarter of the, um, of the 19th century. That was his kind of um, big moment. Uh, and he played a central role in the 1840s and the 1850s in trying to recover the story of the Boston Massacre. And he did so by foregrounding an African-American called Crispus Attucks, who was the first person to die in the protests in Boston. Now, we don't really know much about Crispus Attucks, and neither did Nell. One thing we do know about him is he wasn't just African-American. He was also part Native American. But that part of the story, Nell took out. Nell uh, invented or embellished what we knew about him, turned up the kind of bravery dial to 11, you know, making Attucks seem like he was the guy who got the whole thing started. And he sold this to the American public as an indication that black people had always been there whenever there was a fight with Britain, whenever there was a struggle to defend the nation, black people were always there. He tried to do the same thing with Dartmoor. He went off and tried to look for a figure that would do the same kind of thing. He ended up copying out in his book, uh, Colored Patriots, uh, the Colored Patriots of the American Revolution, uh, which contains a big section on the War of 1812. He ended up copying out uh, a passage about black people at Dartmoor, which had been written in 1816 by a racist white author who'd never been to Dartmoor, and who actually told stories about black people in the prison that discussed their strength and their bravery in governing themselves, not in helping the white Americans to try and escape or celebrate the 4th of July. Or... So Nell went off. I think he didn't realize that this source was written by this person who was a big white racist. Uh, this guy actually was the guy who went down to, uh, the guy who wrote the story in 1816 uh, is the guy who went down to Thomas Jefferson's house in 1801 and inoculated Jefferson's slaves. So he was from Massachusetts, of course, uh, but he had this connection to the slave world, which again, Nell didn't know about. So Nell, in trying to search for a way to make the Dartmoor Massacre work for African Americans in the way that the Boston Massacre did, he ended up reproducing a big paragraph of stuff about how black people are super authoritarian, 
you know, they govern with a big stick, you know, in this prison of theirs, they're doing all kinds of things, you know, to each other in terms of like trying to maintain a strong man's rule, all of those stories he told. And unsurprisingly, that didn't give either Dartmoor or the kind of African-American citizenship struggle the same traction that the story of Crispus Attucks, this brave black man at the Boston Massacre in 1770, that that story offered. Um, so in a way, I think one of the challenges, and this is where I'll leave things, one of the challenges I'm facing is whether to try and structure the story I'm telling as a story of a kind of triumphant claim to American nationality on the part of black people. Is that what this is about? These 1,000 brave black sailors demonstrating their allegiance to the United States. Or is that to hijack them and all of their wonderful kind of stories and all their kind of options in effect and put that in a straitjacket, a straitjacket of US history, not thinking about the wider worlds of the Atlantic and beyond in which some of these black people may have actually lived their lives after Dartmoor. Um, so figuring out a way not to dismiss the significance of this for the black freedom struggle in the US, but to make sure it's not just about that is one of the many challenges I have in trying to write this book. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, everyone. Sorry, I was just curious, um, like you talked about going, so I'm going to ask you about the process, really, oh, yeah. um, like of like tracing these memoirs from the sailors, because as they're coming, like the ships that they're coming back on, presumably they, they traveled over a period of months on different ships and going back to different places, like how on earth do you begin to even kind of like find their stuff and their memoirs? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Th thank you for the question. It's hard. Um, one thing about maritime history, so sort of writing about the sea, oh my God, the nerds who are drawn to maritime history. It is the geekiest, nerdiest place, by which I mean, not just now as well, like in the 19th century, like a 19th century nerd loved mar maritime history. So the ships are a really good way of doing it. Like, if I know that one of these African, oh, okay, this is a trick of the trade. Um, just keep this between us, everyone, and YouTube. Um, so if you want to write a really dramatic passage about an African-American, you can actually find out about one of these ships and all the battles it had, and you know from the register they were there, so just tell the story, because you've got someone who's told it uh, later in the century, you've got another narrative of what happened to that ship. That part is fairly easy. The really hard part is finding the kind of black voices, if you like. But there is one really cool source I found recently, which I'll, I'll tell you briefly about, which as I mentioned, I was down in the National Archives in Maryland. Um, if you were an impressed sailor, so let's say in 1806, you were just sailing out of Philadelphia and on the seas, a Royal Navy ship stopped your ship and just took you off and then put you into the Royal Navy. Here's what you would hope. You would really hope that your wife or your daughter or your sister would write to the State Department in Washington and be like, hey, Henry the sailor has just been kidnapped and this is terrible and could you help us? So down in the National Archives in Maryland, when we talk about emotional labor, there are 900 letters written uh, to uh, or written from family members in the State Department about these individual Americans. And again, in terms of my own nerdery with that big register, what I could do is just uh, go through the six and a half thousand names and figure out which ones were at Dartmoor. So most of those, in fact, all of them would have been before Dartmoor. So these impressment experiences would have taken place before they wound up in Dartmoor. But I went off and I found probably no more than a dozen, but a dozen letters either from black people that wound up in Dartmoor or from their families. And again, there are a number of ways in which gender and women come into the story, but I cannot tell you how kind of um, affecting it is to see the mechanics of what these women did to try to get their husbands out. Because before the war started, if you, so in 1812, if you could convince the State Department, and by the State Department, I mean actually like the Secretary of State, like James Madison is signing all these. So there are black people writing to James Madison saying, help my husband. If you can convince him that the person that you're married to or the person who's your father is really American, he's gonna sort it out. He's gonna write to the British and get that person released. So those stories are really affecting. And when you get the guys, the guys are like, I've written to you 11 times. Why haven't you written back to me? <laughs> and of course, the letters haven't gone through. But do you not love me, my wife? You know, I've written to you 25 times. I'm still stuck in this god-awful ship. Please help me out. So, so, so there's a wonderful paper trail there. I have about 50 Dartmoor prisoners, and about 12 of them are black. So that's, that's one place. But I, need, I mean, I need more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, I guess one thing you can do is see how many of the accounts line up. But um, there are also ways in which, you remember I said there were the accounts that were published straight away. Then there are also accounts in diaries and journals which were never published or were published in like some obscure historical society journal 100 years later. I find those much more reliable because the stuff that people actually wrote down during the prison, I don't know, it just kind of feels like there's something immediate about that. But here's the funny thing about some of the stuff that's written in the 30s and the 40s, and particularly the stuff that's written by Benjamin, uh, by um, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, so you guys probably know a tiny bit about the genre of Jim Crow, minstrelsy. So this kind of like way in which, in, especially in the 1830s and the 1840s, black people become caricatured, kind of mocked, and to some extent dehumanized by white people wearing black face paint and uh, exaggerating their version of what African-Americans look like. And that term Jim Crow, which we later use in the 19th and 20th century to refer to segregation in the South, it actually begins as a character of one of these white guys who invents minstrel shows. His character is called Jim Crow. So in effect, it's a way of mocking African-American culture and undermining both black equality and the idea of black belonging in the United States. Here's the funny thing. Those stories which are written in the 30s and the 40s about Dartmoor, they have a kind of different view of African Americans in the prison than the, than the journals and diaries that are written in 1815 or 1816. What's been upped, what's been increased, like amped up in these later accounts is the idea that black people were just great at entertainment. Oh, it was amazing. If you went to the black prison, they'd be putting on Othello, you know, they'd be having boxing matches, they'd be dancing lessons. I think some of that stuff is true, actually. But the way it's written about suggests that the two things you can get from African Americans are entertainment and violence or authoritarianism. Again, talk about our contemporary moment, right? I mean, this is one of the ways in which uh, black culture has still been represented into the 21st century, right? It's entertainment or it's sport or it's violence. You can see the roots of that in this Jim Crow moment in the 30s and the 40s. And even in these accounts that are just 30 years apart, you can begin to see it kind of working its way into what happened at Dartmoor. So I would, I, to answer the question very shortly, I mean, I would say the uh, contemporary accounts, we've got lots of them from 1815, 1816, you can kind of cross-reference them against each other. But if you've got the register, you can also figure out whether they're just making people up whether they're lying, right? Which is really helpful. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's a surprise. No, but like first of all, have you looked at any of the sources of the French? Yeah. Always looking for an excuse to whitewash the French. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, that's something I need to look into. There is one uh, French prisoner called Louis Cattell who publishes a memoir about the French experience in Dartmoor in the 1840s. So he's our kind of principal source. It hasn't been translated into English, but you know, some of this stuff is quite florid. You don't need great French to realize what's going on. Um, I'm guessing there probably are troves and troves of letters in the French National Archives. Uh, I've not gone looking for them, partly because this project is already kind of big enough, but I think one thing I do have to do, and I appreciate you bringing this up because this has reminded me to do it. When I went off and looked at the prison records, I kind of started with the records when the Americans arrived in 1813. So what I think I ought to do is go back to 1808 when the prison opens and see how, if you like, you know, you've got these two things that are similar. How did British people write about French people? And how do they write about Americans? If I can do the whole thing, that, that's much more manageable than heading off to the archive in France and looking for a ton of material that will be quite hard to find. But yeah, um, the Romans were uh, so kind of obviously caricaturable, like they were so obviously, they're like larger than life that you instantly wonder, right? Did they really try and eat two horses alive? Did they mostly succeed? I mean, like stuff like that. Well, 
Uh, yeah, there were uh, black French prisoners in another British prison in 1798. So actually, uh, people who were um, prisoners from the various wars in Guadeloupe and Saint-Domingue uh, that were brought to uh, uh, another prison on the coast. Um, there were very few black French prisoners in Dartmoor, and I haven't found any evidence of black in the kind of race column, if you like, but... Who knows if they just started to use that when they began getting lots of black faces coming in when the Americans arrived. I'm just not sure. Um, and then the of yeah. Does that shape the oh, my God, yeah. So I haven't talked about this guy. Um, the, everyone who writes about this, I mean, not saying that you're going to go to a lot more talks here about the Dartmoor uh, um, a massacre, but let's say you did. Everyone who talks or writes about this is obsessed with this one character in the so-called black prison, whose name was King Dick. That's his name. Uh, and his real name was Richard Crafus. Uh, he was a sailor from Maryland. He winds up in Massachusetts after the war and becomes a boxing coach. Anyway, listen, uh, I've mentioned to you that I'm very nervous of these kind of orientalizing, racialized visions of black people as kings of entertainment, kings of strongman violence. That was him, right? So when the white prisoners wrote about the black prison, they could go into it. And in fact, white people are in the black prison all the time. Like, this, it, in a sense, it is the kind of social hub of the prison. So the segregation regime doesn't actually stop white people and black people from mixing. It just stops them from sharing political power. But when white sailors wrote about politics in the black prison, they said, oh, yeah, strongman King Dick, he keeps order with his club and his two attendants. So all of the white prisons, they're all governed by these committees, you know, like democracies, basically, right? But the black prison, oh, no, that's King Dick and his club. There's a whole bunch of reasons to be suspicious about this, partly because the tradition of electing a king is something that was actually happening in black communities in New England. This actually is a kind of politics that white people in the prison didn't recognize as authentically black, nor authoritarian, but something that black people had always been doing alongside white elections from which they'd been excluded. Um, but then there's also the fact that King Dick doesn't arrive in the prison until October of 1814. There have been black people in the prison for more than a year before his arrival. So what, he suddenly arrived and everything changed? So I, yeah, um, one of the real challenges is telling all these awesome stories about racial interaction with the, within the prison, but taking off this filter of racism that sees black people as entertainers and autocrats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like, like if there's like a power over them, like with words, yeah. that's why it's not there in the in, in the ships. But like, isn't that the same in the prison? Like they have the guards who like they're constantly voiced. So how is that thing different? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. So in the prison, this is the weird thing about prisons of um, war prisons, uh, POW facilities. Like if you guys end up in prison. Let's not go there. Like, if I ended up in prison in Britain, then there would be an assumption that whatever I'd done wrong, the prison would try to reform me, right? So in effect, our, uh, and I know this is crazy, and that's not what prisons do, and I don't know, prisons are bad in lots of ways, but that's the assumption behind the prison, that rather than it just being a place you put bad people, it's a place where the state attempts to reform bad people. Now, again, you don't have to be Foucault to question whether that's actually how prisons work, but that crucial principle that the guards, the governor, the staff have an interest in changing you makes regular prisons really different from a place like Dartmoor. So with Dartmoor, the prison governor, the agent, had no interest in reforming these prisoners because they weren't there because they'd done anything wrong, right? They were there because they just happened to be on ships that Britain happened to be at war with. So actually, the whole purpose of building Dartmoor is let's have this big humane facility, really large, on a beautiful moor. Okay, it's absolutely freezing. But that, you know, it's beautiful, healthful, it won't be a prison ship. And we'll just leave them there. And we'll try and treat them as best we can. We'll let them govern themselves. Uh, there's a market every day in the prison, so between 9 and 12 every morning, people come in from the local community and sell the prisoners' things. Um, crazily, the prisoners who've been impressed on Royal Navy ships, they actually got paid in the prison by the Royal Navy. 
So when those ships ended up dividing up all the ships they captured, some of the plunder from the Navy ships would just come to the sailors in Dartmoor. There's a ton of money swilling around the prison, right? Now the guards back off. So the crucial distinction between Dartmoor and a regular prison is those guards are not acting like the ship's officers when you're t talking about the ships these sailors have come from. So they're not acting every moment to discipline, to oversee, to shape, to regulate. That doesn't happen. The prisoners have a lot of freedom themselves to do that. And that's where I think the, the wheels come off the whole racial equality thing, right? Like you can show some forms of respect, have some forms of equality with black people if you're a white sailor with like a tyrannical sea captain. But when you're actually asked to share your politics, to live in the same place and try to govern it together, that's where things really get, get tough. So the prison is different, I think.